Um, if you're interested in being involved, just let me know. All right. Uh, Dr. Stockwell is the Senior Director of Analytics and Research Chief Data Scientist at the Hilltop Institute. So I will let you introduce yourself a little more thoroughly. Um, last couple things, if you signed in, I will be giving away uh, t-shirts and books at the end, so don't leave. I'm going to call a couple names. Um, and I think you were okay with questions, Doran. Please. Yep. So that's it. With that, I'll hand it over. Pull your slides up. Services. Uh, 
um, when, when Hillcraft Institute was created about 25 years ago, we were really built around that model of CMS data and, and data at the time. Uh, and so we are, and we are still primarily actually a SaaS shop, um, which you know is becoming rarer and rarer, but uh, we just have a lot of legacy code that you know, we've been at SaaS forever. And uh, we have a university SaaS license, so we don't pay for it, which is super nice. Um, that, of course, is changing not only because uh, SAS is becoming, you know, not required for a lot of the work that we do, um, but it's really hard to find, like, good SAS programmers because a lot of them are either retired or are, you know, with a consulting firm that uh, where SAS is a requirement and they're getting paid, like, you know, twice as much what we pay. Um, so, so language is more flexible. Uh, I write mostly in SAS because that's what I learned growing up. Um, we have a bunch of Python programmers. We have some people with R. Um, you know, primarily when we do model development, we'll do some development in, in SAS and Jump, um, and then we'll deploy in Python. That's kind of the, the path that we usually take. When you say model, what sort of thing do you mean? Uh, I will give three examples. Uh, over the next, we'll see, four or five minutes. Um, any other questions? Or I'll give the whirlwind tour of, of Medicaid and Medicare. Any kind of so, so I'll preface this, uh, and we'll see how many people get up and leave. But uh, I tried to talk about kind of not the softer side, but the more applied side, like the contextual side of you know, data science and statistics. Um, for more technical audiences, which I think you guys probably are, and then save like the math and the equations for the less technical side because I, I want people, the technical people, to understand the context. I want non-technical people to be familiar with the methods. Um, so, no equations uh, in this presentation, but if you want some, I can, we can talk about that later. Anyway, uh, who knows what Medicaid and Medicare are? Anyone? Okay, that's good. Who knows exactly what Medicaid and Medicare are? <laughs> One? Okay. I've been doing it for 17 years and I still don't know. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. The first of which is that for Medicaid, let's start Medicaid, for Medicaid in particular, you know, there are kind of federal uh, overarching guidelines for, for how to operate a Medicaid program, but it is a state program, right? So Maryland's Medicaid program is very different than Virginia's Medicaid program, which is very different than Delaware's Medicaid program. Uh, and it's like that for a whole host of reasons, um, most of which is because the states pay, right? So, so in Maryland and in most other states, uh, the state pays a little more than half of the Medicaid costs for their covered population and the feds pick up the rest. While Medicare, right, Medicare is a federal program, um, there are state initiatives, but the, they're not necessarily state specific. And so, you know, a, a Maryland Medicare beneficiary is uh, governed by quite, quite often the same rules as a Alabama Medicare beneficiary. Medicaid, not the case. And it's especially apparent um, for the long-term care side of, of Medicaid. So, you know, it's a common misconception that um, for if someone gets old, everyone gets old, hopefully, uh, and they start experiencing cognitive and functional decline, that, that Medicare, right, so the, the red, white, and blue card that you get when you turn 65, will, will swoop in and save the day. But they don't, right? So, so Medicare does not pay for um, home community-based services, like having someone come out and, and uh, could be cook your food, could be help you pay your bill or take your medicine, could be help give you a bath, something like that. Um, nor does Medicare pay for nursing home stays, except for what's called rehabilitative stays, so stays that happen after a hospitalization, right? So you, you fall and break your hip, you're in the hospital, you get your new hip, and then you go to a nursing home for rehabilitation, and then once you can walk, you're out. Medicare doesn't pay. Um, so that's what Medicaid comes back into the picture and, and can pay for those residential states. Uh, but the thing about Medicaid, again, is that it's state-specific, and because it's state-specific, states have different ways of covering that 
that long-term care, right? So in Maryland in particular, we have a few of what's called a Weaver program. And I'm getting to the data science part, trust me. But this is, this is important to understand because if you don't get this, nothing else makes sense. And, and these waiver programs are ways for the states to provide care in non-institutional settings, right? So, so Maryland can say, okay, Ian, you, know, you fell and broke your hip and you were in the hospital and then you were in rehab, but while you were in the hospital, you know, your wife passed away and you know, your kids aren't supporting you and you lost lease on your house, so we're going to help you come back into the community and provide you with some sort of supportive care at home that otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't be covered and, and can be very expensive. So these are called waiver programs because the state is asking the federal government to waive certain aspects of Medicaid legislation to allow that care to be, to be given in a non-institutional setting. These waiver programs <coughs> serve the most, we, we say vulnerable at work, uh, but, but, but saying that, that these populations are vulnerable doesn't really, doesn't capture it, right? So these are individuals who, um, without the support provided by Medicaid for these services, would either be living in a nursing home with, with no hopes of, of getting out, um, or, or likely did, right? Be, because they have a level of need that is high enough that they can't take care of themselves, um, and yet, they've exhausted their financial resources to the point where they can't pay for, for health care. So the first two kind of key studies that I'm going to go through focus on this population, right? So these individuals who uh, are well enough to live in the community but with lots of support can't pay for that themselves, which, which I should add is probably most of us in the room, right? Because if, if you're looking at $160,000 a year health care expenditures, and insurance is covering none of it. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to last very long on my own without help, right? Pay for that out of pocket. Um, and I think that, that hopefully these case studies not only are um, helpful for these people, but I think illustrative of the things that you can do with healthcare data, right? And, and again, and it's because context is important. Okay, so three slides, three case studies. Um, again, please, please ask questions as, as they come to you. So part of our role at, at Hilltop, um, maybe about five years ago now, was when Maryland was kind of pulling their disparate waiver programs, right, so these home and community-based services programs together uh, for administrative simplification and to take advantage of some, some financial centers from CMS, um, you know, we were asked if uh, the historical spending of participants uh, was related to their acuity level. Acuity in a very broad sense, right? So we can measure that a bunch of different ways and, and we did. Uh, and it came out of the conversation that, that we had with um, some of the higher ups of the department about this idea of budgeting, right? So um, when you're running a Medicaid agency, you have to have pretty good financial projections for the next year uh, for budgeting purposes and all that. And uh, we didn't have a lot of that. And, and the population that's taking advantage of these types of programs is growing every day, uh, especially five years ago when we, when we significantly um, increased the number of people that could, could participate. And so this question, you know, we, we know that people who are sicker use more acute care services, right? they go to the hospital more. They use more primary care services, they use more specialist services. Uh, what about on the long-term care side? Uh, and, you know, of course, the, any reasonable hypothesis would say, well, sure, right? So if you had a, a higher uh, uh, level of cognitive deficit or a lower level of, of um, you know, physical uh, ability, then you would expect that services like giving you a bath or making sure you take your medicine, um, you, you need more of that. Uh, though, that's not what we found in the data, right? So what we found was that individuals with very high functional experience used about the same as people with, you know, in quadriplegia and, uh, you know, Alzheimer's, advanced Alzheimer's disease and stuff like that. 
And so we were floored, right? Like, the, how how does this make sense? Um, and so we had what what we always do at the state is a focus group, and we asked a bunch of people that participated in the program to come over and say, you know, this is what we're seeing. Like, how how could this be possible? Uh, and it turned out that uh, there were there were many reasons for this, but one of the reasons was that there was not uh, we have a psychologist at work, and he very correctly called it an anchor point. There was no anchor point when building kind of the care plans for these individuals, right? So the way it works is a program participant meets with a, a care coordinator and they sit down with a, you know, a physician and a nurse and um, any family members of the, the participant and they figure out what the person needs, right? Because if a person's getting eight different types of services every week or, or eight different types of services in a day, right? you have to have a plan for who's going to be in the house at what time to do what so the person doesn't end up you know, skipping a meal, skipping a medicine, something like that. Um, and you know, it, it quickly became clear that, that there, was no, there was no anchor right, for those conversations. The care coordinators knew that if their budget was under uh, whatever it was, $85,000 a year, then it just sailed through and, and, and got approved. And so that was like the threshold, right? Uh, clearly we could do better than that. So uh, part of this task was figuring out what segments we split acuity into. Right? And again, there are a bunch of different measures of acuity. Um, we ended up using something called resource utilization groups, which is not quite an industry standard, but pretty close. Um, and, you know, so then data science question number one, how many groups do we need? Okay, we have 46 research utilization groups. Do we need 46 different budget suggestions or do we group we end up with seven? Again, I can go through that at some point uh, later if it's of interest. Um, and then what are those recommendations, right? Because we, we had the data that we had to use was from a broken system. Right? So, so it's not like uh, I could certainly the third example I'm going to talk about where like we had a functioning healthcare system, fairly functioning healthcare system, and so we had data that we needed. Um, we, we didn't have that. So, you know, there was a lot of, um, kind of um, more interesting parts of my job is those focus groups and, and collaborations with physicians and, and nurses and social workers and participants themselves to figure out um, figure out these buttons. So anyway, so we went live. Everything was fine. And then we started doing some, some analysis and we see that there are a bunch of what we call exceptions. Right? So these are individuals who uh, request a care plan that is above their suggested budget amount based on their, their acuity, which is fine, right? So that's uh, perfectly acceptable. It's a suggested budget. The, what happens though is if that plan gets requested, it has to go through all these layers of bureaucratic review of the department. Right? Also fine, like that's, that's the way the program is built. Um, but the question was, how do we, you know, are there methods that we could use to minimize those exceptions while not increasing those budgets to the point where there now be a new higher anchor point, right? So anchor point uh, that, that isn't clinically justified, right? So um, this, program model can do this, and so uh, we made some projections on kind of that the, the budget factor of you know, when you increase a, a budget suggestion by X amount of dollars, how much of those dollars actually get taken up, right? so we need that. Uh, you need your groups and historical distributions across the, the suggested budget, and then minimizing those, those over budget exceptions. Um, so, you know, it was a, a pretty I think once we sat down and figured out how we were going to do it, it was a pretty straightforward like, mechanical exercise of the programming. Um, but getting there was super important. And uh, so we new budgets are, are made and, and we'll go live probably next year. Um, yeah, any questions about that one? Well, yes, the sir? question about the exception. Yes. Is there any possibility that could be for all? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, what was the question? Uh, is there fraud? Yeah, fraud. So, so, we, is there a possibility of fraud? Yeah. 
So is that a concern as well? Yeah. Um, yes. So so we we are lucky in Maryland that we have actually a, a system called in-home services assurance system. So it's a way for providers to like clock in, clock out, but only at the participants' home. It's like clock in, clock out. And and there's you know anecdotal cases of fraud, and I think some of them prosecution. Um, but it's you know it's fairly reasonable, like what we see. You know it's. You expect loss in every system, and, and healthcare is no different. But, uh, but that is the reason for the, the exceptions process. Right? So, uh, not not only for fraud, but for uh, kind of clinical appropriateness. Right. So, if someone um, is quadriplegic, like their their standard protocols of care, uh, where you know if, for example, and, and I should say it's on the other side too. Right. So, if someone's in that eighty thousand dollar budget group and their plan comes out twenty thousand dollars, like that's a problem. Right, because you, you know there's just having someone in a house to take care of someone for so many hours a day, it, it's expensive. So it's on the other side. Uh, yes, sir? Um, does any modeling go into um, the proposed recommended project, or is it just um, someone making it? Yeah, good question. So um, so we, so another nice thing about Hilltop, and again, we are hiring. Um, is that you get to work with a lot of different kinds of data, and um, the the thing that drives the acuity group, so the budgeting group for these individuals, is called um, the NRI uh, home care assessment. So it's it's a very extensive um, clinical and functional survey where a nurse will go out to the participant's house, sit down, and go through you know how many people does it take to get you out of bed? Um, have you ever thought of hurting yourself? You know, can you can you can you get to the grocery store? Have you ever had a skip a meal? Do your caregivers support your you know, individuality and things like that? So it's a it takes about almost three hours to go through for nurse. So it's a, a very standardized clinical form to capture those those functional um, and and medical acuity indicators. And then there is a, an algorithm that builds the resource utilization groups. Yeah. And then those are then then grouped into seven. Sets of budgets. There, there are asset limits for people to be eligible. There are asset limits, yes. Mm -hmm. And is you, what is the number one objective of the program? Is it monetary, or is it to try to keep the person at home? Yeah, excellent question. So, because I'm wondering about inversion. Right. Like, what if it's more expensive to keep them at home than to send a nurse home? Yeah. So, so they stay at home if that's where they want to go, right? Um, so let's see. So for income and assets, it's actually pretty fascinating with Medicaid because you know the, the, I think a common misconception about Medicaid is that it's for poor people, right? And and historically that has just not been the case, right? It's been for poor kids, poor moms, and poor disabled and elderly. That's it. And then now we have Medicaid expansion, at least in Maryland we do, um, and that expands it somewhat. But you know the traditional Medicaid financial eligibility uh, for a single person is like income of less than, I think, $15,000 a year or so, and assets of less than $2,500. For the long-term care side, that increases significantly. So the income goes to, I think, 300% of SSI, which for a single person is probably $35,000 or so, and then that same $2,500 income limit. Um, but there are set asides if you're married, you know. So let's say I have to go in a nursing home. Um, they won't count like my house against me if my wife still lives there and my kids, you know, those, those sorts of, of things. Um, the purpose of the program. So for Medicaid, long-term care in general, the purpose was this is back in 1965 when it was written was to provide care for people in nursing homes. Now it's written in the legislation. What the waiver is, right, is the state saying to the feds, please waive that in the nursing home requirement so that we can provide care in the most appropriate setting for that person, right? So, so if there's an individual who is quadriplegic and has advanced dementia, but is otherwise, um, you know, stable on the acute care side, right? So they don't have, um, like, bed sores that can get infected or uh, they're not self-harm, or uh, you know, dialysis, like more acute uh, 
care things, really that for, for their health and safety, it, it requires a, a facility-based care program, right? Um, that is what would override an individual's desire to be at home. Right, so they said, I really want to be at home, and yet, you know, they, they lived in squalor and they had open wounds and they were, you know, they were septic and blah, blah, blah. Then it is, you know, it, I don't know that it happens very often, but it, it can be a case of, of a health and safety issue. But, but, the, but we as a nation, and, and certainly in the field, have said, if someone wants to be at home, we need to let them be at home as long as possible. And I thought it was possible. Maybe not. Okay. All right. I need to speed up. Um, okay. So another another waiver example. Um, Maryland, unfortunately, has a pretty significant waiting list for their waiver programs. Right there, they're popular um, because they have these the, the increased financial ability requirements, um, and they provide care. Of, least restrictive setting possible. Uh, so, and, and yet, you know, there, uh, there are a certain number of slots that are available for, for these programs. Now we have a state plan option too that allows for kind of a lower level of services for the general Medicaid population. Um, but for, for some of these programs in particular, um, there, there is a significant waiting list. And so the way historically that Kind of slots on the program have been divvied out on that waiting list has been, you know, you've been waiting the longest, you get the slot. Right? So this is kind of first in, first out uh, idea. Um, and yet, uh, when the waiting list kind of grows, right, that first in, first out, kind of loses relevance because someone who, you know, years ago has said, well, I have this functional need and I need help, you know, a couple years after that, they, they might not need help, they might not be around, uh, they might have died, they might have gone to nursing home and there's just no, no way to get them out. Um, so, you know, we were asked to, to go through this exercise of, you know, what are the other options? And of course, if the idea is, to your question, of, you know, the, what's the purpose of these programs? The purpose of these Medicaid waiver programs is to give people community-based options, alternatives that aren't a nursing home. Right? And there are people that prefer nursing home. That's okay. That, that's, you, can, you can have that here. Um, and so then, you know, if you're dealing with a population who's on the waiting list that are in the community, right, they're functioning sometimes fairly, but they're functioning in the community, then what is a more uh, kind of fair, you know, efficacious um, way of getting out the slots? And, and the answer that, that we came up with in terms of our clients was, uh, well, let's use the risk of nursing home admission, right? Because if these are people that prefer a community option, that, then, then we can assume that they would go to a nursing home if there was really no other choice. Uh, so, it's so a model question, right? So, we built a model. Um, you know, given the kind of wealth of information that we know about these potential participants, uh, which of these factors are most significant in? Uh, identifying their risk of that long-term institutionalization. And so uh, we do uh, a lot of like time to event models, so pattern, and I'll talk about some time analysis um, in the next next example here. Uh, but you know we yeah you know, I'll skip over the math part, but we took most of what we knew about people that, that would be relevant to a panel of experts like physician, nurse, and social worker. Um, and we have we're lucky at, at Hilltop to have not only Medicaid, Medicaid claims data and not only this clinical and functional assessment data, but also nursing home data. Right? So we can, we can track individual service time and see who then went to a nursing home, not for post-acute care stay, right? Not for rehab, but, but for residential care. Um, and we built a model, and uh, we have you know, a, a set of, of score code and coefficients on, on different um, pieces of their clinical and functional profile um, and have built you know this kind of risk ranking methodology so that when you take the whole list of people waiting you can see who is at the highest risk of, of having this long-term nursing home. Um, 
that wasn't the end though, right? Because uh, another very great part of my job is meeting with stakeholders. And these are providers and participants, mostly participants, and, and legislators and, and those sorts of folks. And so, you know, I can stand up there and say, oh, we built this four from heavens model and we can identify with, you know, X significance, uh, blah, 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 and they're like, okay, well, you know, we don't care. Um, so, so what does that mean, right? Like, what does that mean for the people? And so we did a simulation exercise where you know, we had, we knew who was on the waiting list. We knew when they got on the waiting list, right? And we knew their risk score based on our model. And so we could say, you know, this Ian got on you know, like however many years ago, and he's number uh, 1001 on the list, right? So uh, we're going to have to go, we're going to have to call a thousand people's names before we get down. And we know his risk score, and he is at, you know, one of the lowest risk for in the affordable uh, nursing home admission, and so we're going to rank him as 3,000, right? So he, he's going backwards. But the other Ian, maybe he ranked at 10, right? So he's going to get called sooner than this, this methodology is done with us. Um, and, and so again, so you know, we have to explain this, and you know, the participants, like, they understand, and they get it, and they understand that there's a problem, they, they agree that this is a, an appropriate solution, but then the question is, so, so quantum, like, who, who is going up, who's going down, like, how much, like, how is this going to change, um, you know, the people's understanding? And these are these are tens of thousands of people. People's understanding of their their place in line. Um, and so we did this simulation where, you know, we, we had those two. We could do deltas and uh, different simulations based on the selection criteria. Right. So, are we saying we're going to throw time out of the equation and use all risk? Are we going to include time as a covariate in the model? Are we going to, which, which is what we end up doing, kind of split you know, each group of people that we do outreach to, some who have been waiting the longest and some who are the highest risk. And then what is that split, right? Is it 50-50, is it 25-75, is it 80-20? And then how do each of those scenarios play out in, in you know, how uh, people's rank within, within the, uh, the waiting list move? And so we, we did a bunch of uh, scenarios and, and presented them, um, and we settled on one. Uh, again, not we. I presented the stakeholders told me what they were going to do, uh, and that, that went live uh, two months ago. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, and, and to me, you know, it's interesting. Um, for those of you who have worked, with this, have worked in the state, you know that you know, budgets are tight. Uh, even when times are good, budgets are tight, which is funny. Um, and, you know, one of the kind of the competing pieces of legislation that was meant to address this was, well, let's just, you know, open up the programs to everyone that's on the waiting list. And our uh, budget management office downtown did the fiscal note, and it was like $700 million a year. And I mean, it was just insane. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's hard because we're talking about entitlement programs, but we're talking about a, a kind of specialist subset within an entitlement program. Um, and uh, so, so one of my kind of backgrounds is as an economist, and we learn about, you know, efficient allocation of scarce resources. And this is one of those, right? Like, the legislature has said that we can't give everyone who wants a spot a spot, and that sucks. But how do we do the best with what we have because we're not getting any more? And so this was a lot more attempt to do that. Any questions on this one? Yes, sir. So from the time you started discussing this and uh, presenting it to the sh stakeholders, uh, to the time that they uh, came up with uh, where they stand on everything, how long did it take them to make, see the evidence and make the decision? Uh, so my first, let's see, my first presentation on this topic was last October. And it was to kind of introduce the concept uh, it, and to see if, if it was even viable, right? Like, I, I fully expected to walk in that meeting and, and do my presentation, and, I mean, I've been talking to these people for, like, 10 years. I was expecting people to, like, throw things at me, because they know me, I know them, and it's like, you know, this is, this is an idea. Uh, and they didn't, and so the, the final decision was made 
probably June of this year, so pretty quick. Um, and it helped because, you know, um, like the Medicaid director was on board, the legislature has understood it and, and on board. Um, and I think, this unsolicited advice, I think, something that helped was, you know, don't talk to people, like stakeholders, like you expect them not to understand what you're talking about. Right, because a, a lot of these people, like they, that's how, how they have lived their lives, is it, being talked to, talked down to, right? And when you just say, this is what we're trying to do, this is what the model looks like, right? This, this is what a hazard is. Like, if you don't treat it as a black box and just open, and there's like intellectual property concerns and you know, like trade stuff, then I get that. But if you tell people how things work, it's understandable, right? Like, they get it, and once and once they understood it and felt comfortable with it, you know they, they saw the, the power. That was good. A couple of questions. Yes, sir. Is there any concern about the bias, potential bias, in the simulation model? Excellent question. So uh, I'm not concerned with bias in the simulation, right? right. Because that was based on on the first score that was known, uh, and and the, the time that they've been on the, the waiting list. Um, so we actually, in, in consultation with some faculty in our information system department. We just got funded um, an NSF award to test for fairness, right? So, so test to see if there is um, you know, extent bias and historical data that's then being propagated here. Um, yeah, so that, that work is starting. We just had a kick off on Monday. Um, and it's really protected class bias, right? So like, are there protected classes that are, that are over or an underweighted in the model. Um, you know, I don't think there is, and I think that uh, if if we find that there is, like certainly we're going to fix it. Um, I'm kind of worried about how we're going to fix it. I think we're going to have to rely on you know, more clinical and expertise and maybe even say we're going to put, put some sort of multiplier in there. Um, but yes, a good question. And certainly, you know, it's it was funny. Uh, one of the stakeholder meetings, um, uh, one of the questions I posed them was, you know, we have people think it's just it's older folks that, that take advantage of these programs, and, and it's not. It's older people with uh, physical and cognitive decline, and it's a lot of younger people, right? Physical disabilities and stuff. And so we we went to them. I went to them with um, options for age, right? So like, do we do we bin people by age? Do we have different models? Do we do this categorical? Do we you know do some experimental something? Or do we even include it, right? Because, and this kind of gets back to the, to the goal. If we're going to say that, irrespective of age, right, it is physical and cognitive functioning, right, that, that should dictate an individual risk. That if age is aside from clinical or you know clinical and cognitive functioning, um, if age is significant in the model, right, if it's if it's capturing something else, is that even relevant? We say, irrespective of age, you know, age will limit the level of recovery is to. And, and the answer was yes, we want age. So, I mean, even at that level, like that interaction was there, which is nice. But yes, that NSF grant does came through. That's excellent. The call that's the public uh, receive and the public didn't get to this kind of minimum wage of. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So, so my, my boss is our executive director, um, and I think she's still waiting for like that call from. Baltimore Sun, uh, she gets those calls on them, so that's good. Uh, it, you know, I think it's a good question because the, I think the public here, um, it, it means so many things. Like, I am confident, and, and this is my own personal thing, right? I am comfortable that the groups that I have had a chance to spend like a lot of time with and explain how this works are made up of a representative portion of, of provider, of participants, right? So the people that have have lived in nursing homes 10 plus years and were able to come out and live live at home um, because of these programs. Uh, I'm comfortable that they understand the way it works and they would rather do it this way than, than the way that it was done. Um, you know, the, the public at large I mean, I've been talking for like 50 minutes, and I'm just getting to this point. I mean, I don't even know. Like, how do you how do you capture that? You know, in a little five second report. I don't know. Um, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, 
how do you go about validating the simulation model? Yeah, great question. Um, so, so in this case, uh, t to me, it, it, was, it wasn't outside of validation, but because we had all the information about the historical, right? right this wasn't a, uh, let's say, what it's going to look like five years from now. It's, we have our reading list, right? We know when people got on, and we have all the information that we can use at this launch tomorrow to rank them, right? And so, and so we could know, like, who moved how many spots based on which scenario, with certainty. Um, for the future, right, so, so how applicable is this as five years down the road? Uh, that's tougher because kind of the mix of participants in our program is changing, right? So we have the baby boomers are retiring, they're getting older, um, and yet we have a whole lot of other younger physically disabled individuals who, you know, are saying, I, I'm not going to the nursing home, I'm 21 years old. Um, and you know, individuals are living longer who, are, who have uh, developmental disabilities and have training programs. Um, so that's, that's kind of what's here. Okay. okay. Uh, move on to the last one here. So this one is a little different. So I've talked a lot about long term care and community based services, you know, the, the elderly and disabled population. Uh, this is, and, and so, you know, you ask about the public. This is this is the most public model that, that we have so far. Um, so who here gets health care from their employer? I'll wait for one, right? So so you have a plan, like the employer plan that's united or group runs, right? So that's a that's a managed care organization. Um, and your employer pays a couple hundred dollars a month or a couple thousand dollars a month, depending uh, to the plan and says we wash our hands of Ian's healthcare expenditures, you are fully financially at risk now. Uh, have fun. Uh, so Medicare, right, for those of you who don't know, has an option like that, right? So there's traditional Medicare fee for service where you have your program blue card and you say, you know, I'm gonna get my primary care visit, and then the doc it bills Medicare 150 bucks and Medicare pays it and you're done. Or you can say instead of my Medicare Group Service card, I would like Medicare to pay a managed care plan, thousand dollars a month, I ever mentioned. Uh, and then that managed care plan pays for all the services I use. Sometimes you get added benefits, but usually in their own network and those sorts of trade-offs. Uh, Maryland, for a whole bunch of reasons that I won't go into, um, has never had a high penetration of those Medicare, they're called Medicare managed plans, right? So these managed care plans um, that, that Medicare, that is optional for Medicare beneficiary. Uh, and so, though, one of the goals of managed care is to actually manage care. And it, it's arguable how much of a managed care plan actually does that, but, but it's the right idea, right? Especially with the Medicare population, which is who we're working with. So these are individuals who are over 65 or who are under 65 and disabled and have been disabled long enough that they qualify for social security uh, disability insurance and, and their own Medicare through that. And so the, the question was, well, we don't have a lot of managed care plans in Maryland, but we believe in managed care, so what do we do? And the answer was the Maryland Primary Care Program. So this is a plan that reimburses practices for care management for Medicare beneficiaries. Um, and it, you know, under the, the Kind of knowledge, it's not an assumption anymore. Um, that you know, there are a lot of things that doctors and physician practices can do, uh, but care management is not their strong suit because that's, that, that's not their strong suit. They historically have not been reimbursed for this. Um, you know, it's I, the, at least the physician that I talk to, it's important to them, but it's just not something they have time for. If they're trying to perform the practice. So. Um, the idea is uh, we can reimburse practices for their time in care coordination, or we can reimburse practices and then they can they can consult with you know the specialty providers of care coordination services to provide those. Um, but here are the rates that we're going to give you for participants, um, and this was in 
comes to digital CMS and you know the, the amount of money that is available for a given person in a given month for their care coordination is, is just not adequate for much care coordination. It, it's just it's just not. Uh, so again, right, this, this is an economist thinking this is another scarce resource issue. Right? So we have um, only a certain amount of care coordination resources available. How do we divvy them? Uh, and again, you know, we consulted with, with the Maryland Primary Care Program folks and, and went out to the stakeholders. And the, the metrics that we settled on was instead of, as before, the risk of a, a nursing, long term nursing home admission, it was an you know, avoidable hospital event. Right? So this combines um, an inpatient hospitalization for what's called a, a preventable quality indicator. So for something like asthma or something like diabetes, right? So, so conditions that uh, with proper management should never show up in the hospital. They just shouldn't, right? So if you are on your insulin and you're getting your checkups or if you have your inhaler and, and your, uh, your, your proper environmental uh, uh, assessment for your home, then like, those should not end up in, in the hospital, nor should they end up in the emergency department. So our, for, for us, the avoidable hospital event was that PQI qualified inpatient hospitalization or an emergency department visit for those for, for any of those same conditions. Um, and so for this model, right, so we did, um, and this is kind of our standard for now, although we're testing some ensembles of different things, uh, a, a street time survival model, right, because we want something that, again, is explainable, right? So I can go in from a stable group and I say, this is a risk score that, that is produced by this model, and this is what it means, right? It is a, it's likely to go to this horrible hospital event and such and such. Um, and that is a lot easier to sell, I mean, not sell, but it's a lot easier to, to obtain buy-in than, you know, this is a RNN and this is what it spits out, and yeah, it's kind of this, and what are the relevant factors for uh, I don't know. Um, but again, so we're on something a little bit easier. Uh, so, this, I think, and, and I, I heard a professor at MIT at a conference that I went to a while ago say that, you know, you know you're a good data scientist when 90% of your time is a piece of feature engineering, right? So I guess that's what, like, the kids are calling it these days. Uh, call it code or coaching because you're building a code as well. When that's 90% of your time, and then 10% of the time is actually, like, plug and chug and, and running a tuning model. And that's what this has been, right? So, um, if any of you have worked in healthcare, you know, like on the assessment data or claims, there is just a ton of information, and a lot of it can be coded, you know, 10,000 different ways for a given variable. And then, you know, so do you cluster? Is it categorical? Not really. You know, it, those sorts of questions um, really come into play. So, we actually started this. Um, as academics and a liquor review, right? So, so what are the factors that uh, prior researchers have found to be significant predictors of avoidable hospitalization? We found a bunch, and then we found more, and then we found more, and then we moved to emergency department visits, and found more and more and more, and we built them all out, and we built you know about 200 of them, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but these are built factors, right? This is a you know, loading a categorical variable, just loading it. Kind of Play out, um, and so we built them up. Uh, we did our concentration curves, tested a couple of um, kind of competing risk metrics, um, and found that ours ours perform, performs very well. And this is going live uh, October 11th, so less than a month from now. And again, with the idea that for given practice, right? So let's say they can only reach out to. And maybe twenty percent of their patients every month. They need to know which ten or twenty percent make that phone call to. Um, and our hope is that we're not overriding, you know, the, their clinical acumen. Right? We're not saying Ian's at the top, so this is your only option. You know, you're going to click that button and call me. It is, you know, when you can kind of expand your portfolio of, of clients that need that kind of acute care management. Um, this is the person that's most likely to have that avoidable hospital event, so you should call that person. 
yep. So, this is me. Um, we're hiring. Again, I didn't say that already. Uh, shoot me an email if you're interested. You can do a lot of great work. And any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, can you go back to the last slide? Sure. Um, so on the last bullet, you say uh, you know, basically based on uh, relative risk of avoidable hospital bed, right? So how do you determine what a hospital bed costs that is it actually money-wise beneficial to go to the hospital rather than pay this coverage? Right, so so this isn't coverage, right? So yeah. I, I, thank you for the question because it, it's worth explaining. So, so what the Maryland Primary Care Program does, it says, you know, we believe, this is CMS, so this is a, a kind of a federally sponsored initiative. We believe that care coordination, meaning like the, the touch of a person, person to make sure that they can get food, they can manage their medicine, they know when their next doctor's appointment is, they can get there, you know, if not, how do we call it, the cab, how do we do Uber, like those sorts of things, right? So that, we believe that that, that covering that as a service, just like covering you know, a primary care visit as a service and not just covering the personal name of the hospital, that net is a cost-saving venture, right? Care coordination can be uh, And there have been, there's been a lot of work on whether or not that's true. Uh, you know, when we did our literature review, most people found that if you just carte blanche cover it as a service and let people bill, right, as, as you would bill for, for anything, there is a over provision of that as a service, right? But if you focus it on those most riskiest people, right? So those, for those individuals with marginal benefit and that care coordination is highest, then you can see extreme cost savings. Um, after the model goes live, so we have a, a grant in to do an evaluation, um, and and we expect that because we know how much those avoidable hospital events cost, and and we will know uh, which individuals. You know, this tool kind of prompted that care coordination intervention. We hope to have a, a firm, like, cost savings figure of, uh, of the model. Yeah. Okay. Talking about the care coordination, yes, sir. I, I did a research project, it's somewhat related to that. I, I'm looking at the uh, end stage renal disease okay. uh, dialysis facilities quality, specifically when they are hospital readmission. The, uh, the avoidable, avoidable readmission, right? right? They shouldn't be readmitted uh, within a short period of time, like 30 days. But if they do, there's something that's not right, mm -hmm. and the culprit could be careful of yeah. So one, one thing that I found is that the, the facilities uh, can, uh, that has lower uh, staffing patient ratio Meaning that they have less staff for, for patients, mm -hmm. tend to have a higher rate of yeah. uh, I'm not and, and that kind of aligns with what you are talking about in terms of yep. look at it, uh, avoidable hospital events. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we don't have um, you know, practice staffing necessarily. I don't know we had it, but it fell out. Um, but something that, that was extremely significant was uh, this was one of this is a piece to end here. It was the proportion of um, primary care experience over 12 months, or non-hospital experience over 12 months that was provided by a single provider, right? So um, you know, if you go to the doctor 10 times, how many of those 10 times was actually the same or doctor or nurse or PA or whatever? Uh, it's a very significant, right? So the better continuity of care, you know, like, like increased staffing, helps a lot. Yes, sir. Oh. Data science question. Um, you talked about feature selection. So, how do you do feature selection? Do you have like general algorithms, or is there a specific domain knowledge required to actually do the feature selection? Yeah. What have you found more beneficial? Yeah, um, good question. So, so this is like raging in my office right now. This is this is conversation, and I won't get to all. Um, so, our feature selection is driven primarily um, by. Uh, kind of clustering in on stepwise production now. Um, you know, it, it has, it's been great. You know, it, it helps because we're, we're running a whole bunch of data and we don't have like huge computers. 
um, to run this stuff on. Uh, but one of the additions that we're, we're hopefully going to launch later this month, I'm sorry, later, later this year, is uh, in addition to kind of this relative risk ranking of, of a panel, is to add reasons for risk. Like so, of all our features, like which are the ones that are indicated in a given person um, that, that have kind of the biggest you know, added power of their, their risk score. And so the question that, that I ask my guys is, you know, can we do kind of variable reduction and have this work accurately, right? So if, if we're doing a cluster and there's, you know, three kind of rare conditions that are clustering together, and we drop two of them out, and someone has one of those two that we dropped, but not the one that we have, not only are we under-risking them, but that reason for risk is going to be represented in the Bitcoin right? So um, it's an ongoing conversation, but that's what we do now. We, we have a kind of variable clustering piece that we go through and make sure that it makes you know, some semblance of clinical sense and then stepwise to get into the, the survival model. Yes, sir. Um, how many um, sound points are we, are we talking about? Are we talking about hundreds of thousands or millions of data points? Uh, so we have, let's see, for 250,000 people, we get a rolling 36 months clinical history. Um, those files are, if we have to hack them, let's see, 150 gigs. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of records, maybe 200 million records total. Um, and, and though, so, so I said, you know, we do discrete time travel. So what we do is we actually build a person month in here, right? So, so we're not saying, so, you know, we're not doing a hazard model, we're saying we're going to assume the standard hazard function um, and, and kind of do time to event as a variable, right, censorship. Um, but we're doing person month of those 36 months and then a spline for time to event from, from uh, the start of participation. So, I mean, it's intensive. Our pre-processing takes, so we're on like a 10 core machine now with 64 gigs of RAM and it takes like six hours to do everything, and that's all the condition identification criteria, um, all the uh, procedural indicators, continuity of care, and drug stuff, and then environmental risk factors, the reactors, and everything. And then the training model is not that long, maybe three hours or something. But it's not on, on a few thoughts. Yes, sir. Um, so you mentioned that this came out of like an academic uh, exercise of the review, and how do you go from that to having something that you're putting in front of it? Is it like you white paper it and they come to you, or you say, we have a solution for you? Yeah, uh, good, good question. So this is a good story. Uh, so so it, it came out of a literature review, uh, but that was, I say came out of, it was really the first step, right? So, so the project was already conceptualized before we started that literature. And we went in the literature review saying, look, I want this lit review to read like something you can read in a journal. But I want every you know, the, the feature in the code to point to something on that written lit review. Right? So, so when you look at the kind of the pre-processing of the, the model training and scoring code that does this, we, we have citations in that code that points to something in the lit review. And in that lit review, it points to you know, the, the clinical definition and, and where it came from and expected significance, expected direction, and all that stuff. Um, so that was the first step, and we did it very deliberately uh, because one of my kind of big pet peeves is like, is data mining for data mining's sake, right? So let's like throw everything into TensorFlow and see what TensorFlow does. <coughs> um, because I, I have seen that done and seen a lot of garbage come out of it. That is just, it's just not defensible and, and it's certainly not, you know, applicable five years down the road. Um, but, but that was after we had uh, a lunch with the, Dr. Howard Half, the head of the you know, primary care program, and he came over to UBC and, and you know, he 
very quickly got down to brass tacks, like we know we have no data, we have lots of data, um, how can we use data? And um, it was just a, it was a wonderful discussion because you know it, it, so much of my work in, in Hilltop's work has been efficient allocation of resources. And, and when you talk to a primary care doc, they say, you know, I have the health information exchange and I have my electronic health record and I have insurers calling me and all this stuff and like all I want to do is practice medicine and I have all these screens, I don't know what these numbers, like what do they really represent? And I said, like, you know, our work is kind of building these models to distill all the relevant information about a person. Right? And, and not as and people are simple, right? It's, it's not as simple as that. We're not trying to, to kind of boil people down to a number. But when you understand risk, and not financial risk, but event risk, you know, that should play a role in, in the way providers practice. And he said, okay, you know, how much is it going to cost? And let's get started. Do you want to do any uh, patient matching issue when you did that process? Uh, so we haven't because uh, our work data is, comes directly from Medicare, right? So we have uh, the MBI and, and HIC and, and you know, name and social security uh, address. So uh, the, the attribution for a patient to a practice, that all happens at CMS uh, and then we get the funds, yeah. So, so we have had to do that before um, and it is no fun, right? Because some of these models, like you, there is no room for error. Um, luckily, we didn't have that. So, is it all claims based, or do you incorporate any clinical data? So, this is claims based with uh, zip code level environmental factors <coughs> from like IRS and uh, ACS and, and some other places. Uh, the next additional data set will be um, we're getting, uh, we have gotten patient address. And so we are doing like distance to a pharmacy, uh, recent housing code violations, this is what I'm about, so okay. uh, and then hopefully next year we're going to start getting batches of um, social welfare surveys that the practices will be doing their participants. Hopefully I mean, we'll, we'll see if that happens, but that's the plan. Um, so a lot of these providers are on different EHRs, and they're not talking well to each other, let alone talking to us. Um, hopefully, you know, someday. What about like any other clinical quality data? Do you put any of that? Or? Uh, you know, not really now. Um, we, we've had some preliminary talks, I think this is going to be next year, about getting some sort of lab data in, right? And so building, you know, well, if we know someone with diabetes and we have <coughs> stages of diabetes, but like, are they getting you know, their blood tests regularly, things like that. Um, but not a lot of Finder, like practice level effects um, at this point because we just haven't decided. Yes, sir. Uh, so, like you said, healthcare is a very complicated domain. Um, so, I was wondering how long have you been practicing analytics in this area, and do you have any, like, maybe two tips for data scientists getting started in a new domain, how to get up to speed quickly? Yeah, so I am uh, I'm in my 17th year. Uh, but I started as an undergrad. So I, so I started at, at Hilltop actually as an undergrad web developer. Um, and then I was a database admin and then programmer. I'm, I'm still a programmer, really. So this is going to be fancy titles for some reason. Um, and so yeah, 17 years. And, then, and it's, it's really the only like professional job I've had. Right? I came right out of undergrad. Um, I did some time at CMS on loan, and you know I've had industry collaborations, but, but I've been working on things. Um, and so, if I had a tip, you know, it's uh, so I'm saying like there's no equations here. I know you guys are technical folks, but there aren't equations. And it is because context matters, right? So like, I sent like the linear program, program example, right? Like that, it's not that much code. That doesn't. Um, but if you don't understand what you're trying to do and be very, I mean, like intimately knowledgeable with the data sources and what's where and really what they mean, then it's just, you can't even write the simple code, right? The little complicated. Uh, so, tip number one is definitely context matters. Um, you know, for me in healthcare, so, so my, my bachelor's are in um, information systems and, and finance, 
And so I was, you know, I was sure that I was going to go to Wall Street and like get some fancy punk job or something. Um, and though, after working in healthcare for a little bit, like the the it's so touchy feeling, but like the the gratification that you get from doing something that matters to people, um, I, I would suggest really kind of thinking about how important that is to you. Because I was telling you earlier, right? Like when, when I interview people, one of the first questions is like, do you want to be rich? Right? Like if you, you know, if you're coming in with a PhD in computational statistics, I would love to have you. I'm not going to pay you four hundred thousand dollars a year. Like I just I can't do that. Right? So how how do you value what you want to spend your day doing? And if that's making you know a lot of money, then you can go do that. But if, if you want to make a difference, you know, think about that and decide that now because it's going to mean not having a BMW, you know, not having a fancy house. You know, you're you're going to eat. You're going to eat well, but but you're not going to you're not going to be wealthy. So so thinking about if that's important to you sooner rather than later because I mean I we hire kind of mid career professionals that are like I can't do I can't do finance anymore. You know, like it, it hurts my soul. So this is good option. Any other questions? Yes ma'am. I'm just curious about the performance of the model. So yeah. how good is like acceptable? Yeah, so this so this one, um, so our kind of primary comparator is what's called a, a hierarchical condition category. So it's a CMS derived, uh, you know. Another thing that, that I've learned over the years is like, when you say the word risk, you gotta be really sure what you're talking about because if you're talking to five people, each one of those five people are gonna think risk is something that is different than what you think it is. So ACC, hierarchical condition category. So it's really a measure of financial risk, right? So it's what do we know about an individual's clinical profile in this year and that we can use to predict next year's costs, right? And, and so there are providers that are using HCC risk boards as risk, thinking that's something like this, right? It is not, it's financial, it's, it's actuarial risk next year, not event risk next month, right? So it's a big difference. Um, but that's what they had, so, so that was our comparator. So um, I didn't put our concentration curves up here, but uh, if you look at, uh, our condition categories, and again, ranking is what we're interested in, right? So we want to rank panels. Um, the top 10% of panels ranked by HCC, uh, let me get right. So it was uh, just over 30, like 31% of the next month's avoidable hospital events, and the top 20% ranked by HCC. You know, it was like high 40% of the board of hospital events. So, so not bad, it's certainly better than, than chance. So our current production model, the top 10% is 50% of avoidable hospital events, and our top 20% is seven, like 70 some percent of oil hospital events. Um, so, so I mean, I, to me, that was, that was actually a lot better than I was thinking we would get uh, just with, with the clinical data uh, and, and clinical environmental risk factors. Um, and so from here, we have hopefully two more years of development work. Um, we're really taking two paths, right? So how do we add data sources, right? So uh, social, social survey data and house level environmental factors. And then how do we ensemble on some, some different models of RNNs and transports and that sort of thing. Um, and yet, though, keeping the explainability, right? And that, because that is key. This is, this is never going to turn into a black box that we don't know really how it's working. You can't explain it to someone um, because I think to me, like when you can't explain to someone how it works, they're very uh, unlikely to, to be people's care of it. And, and they shouldn't. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, so what you brought up about the black box was to explain. So don't you think people will like kind of game the system if they know how, what factors matter most and how to do the way? Like patients? Yeah. Um, it, it, it's a good question. Uh, in, in this case, I don't think so. 
um, because you know gaming the system would mean yeah going like going and getting diagnosed with a condition that you don't have and you have to be introduced to a provider I guess and even then really what you're going to gain from it is a call from a nurse like asking if you're okay and if you need help um, I I can't imagine that that's that that's going to happen I mean, that being said, you know, there, there may be providers um, that, uh, I mean, how could they, could they bill for the call? No, uh, they, no, they don't. I mean, this they is a, a flat rate. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the only thing that I could think of is if a provider, so, you know, if in the out years we use this as a provider quality measure, right? So, how within the entire program, what is the provider's panel's risk within the entire program cohort, right? So it's like a measurement of a panel risk. I guess they could gain that by over-diagnosing at some point, but the model will catch it because we do quarterly retraining so that those new diagnoses wouldn't be significant unless they're going, actually going to the hospital and getting diagnosed there, which you know, they're not going to be in the hospital, not on that side. Uh, it's probably not. I, I'm, I'm not too worried about it. Those are your questions. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, yes. Your model predicts the risk of the avoidable hospitalization in each, in each given month. In the next month. In so that's so we train on 36 months historical, right? First of month. Okay. And then we score at what we call person now, right? So the most recent. Start with a certain month's how because you said it's claims, right? So you're not real time. Right. That is <laughs> Yeah, so we actually get it through um, what's called it's the Medicare CCLA. So it, it's it's the stream of claims. So you know providers they can still take their time billing. Um, but with the EHRs now, like we see claims lag going down uh, to I mean it's not nothing, but but it's it's reasonable. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks for listening.